Hello team, Dr. Jack Cordy here for the final stage of the inflammatory response. Now this really isn't part of the inflammatory response, which is why I didn't include it in the SSRR, sensing signaling response resolution of the inflammatory response. This is after the inflammatory response has happened and we just have a piece of tissue damage that is now sterile because the immune system has done its thing and killed all the pathogens in there. And it's just sitting there waiting to repair. What are those processes that occur during tissue repair to get our tissue finally back to normal after the damage or infection has occurred? Now, this immunohistochemistry image right here with fluorescent probes just shows you a lovely little thing up here, and this is scar tissue. Um, you can see how densely packed it is, and it doesn't look like a normal parenchymal section right there. And so scar tissue is one of the results of uh, uh, an aberrant tissue repair and a less than successful version of tissue repair. Anyway, let's jump into the details. I always like to start with a beautiful image here. So we've gone through all of this. We've gone through edema resolution, neutrophil resolution, macrophage resolution, and now we're heading towards tissue repair. A key part of tissue repair involves uh, an often overlooked thing, and that is what holds cells in place. I want you to answer that question in your head. What holds cells in place? Now, hopefully you know the answer to that, and the answer is the extracellular matrix. What is the extracellular matrix? Well, it is a mesh of proteins and polysaccharides, which means long chains of carbon of sugars to form carbohydrates and polysaccharides um, and often these two interact to form um, proteoglycans um, so that's a protein uh, long chains of glucose um, and other sugars mixed together in a glycosylated protein way to create a network one of the major components of that is the protein collagen it's about 30 percent of the extracellular matrix but really it's just these long stringy molecules that are interconnected like a net and the cells sit in that net and often they have protein in their membrane, integral membrane proteins, that interact directly or generate or uh, are, perp uh, are directly connected to the extracellular matrix to allow the cell to hold its spot in the extracellular matrix, adhere itself to that net. So here I've drawn it as um, some chicken wire, and that's great. And now we have some uh, parenchymal cells here dotted along the extracellular matrix, and we have a resident immune cell just sitting there. Um, it's nice and resolved. There's no more inflammation going on. But here we have some tissue damage. We've lost that... Um, We've lost some dead cells, but fortunately the extracellular matrix is intact. So we can see the extracellular matrix, this chicken wire, is nicely intact. All we have is some dead parenchymal cells. So what happens next? Well, what happens next depends on the tissue type. Now, some tissues, like the uh, intestine, uh, the, the epithelia of the intestine, which is damaged all the time, and the liver, which is damaged all the time, depending on how much you enjoy a tazzy bitters, um, uh, is damaged all the time so those two organs have intrinsically proliferative tissues what that means is the parenchymal cells themselves can divide and replicate to fill that tissue damage spot right there so um, we've got a bit of tissue damage and all that's happened is the parenchymal cells have divided and we end up with um, some more parenchymal cells to fill that spot that's best case scenario when it comes to tissue damage which is why our body has evolved to do that in the areas of the brain that are most areas of the body that are most frequently damaged like the intestine and the liver now the skin is a little bit different and that's because um, uh, the surface of the skin has low metabolically active cells in there, in fact often dead cells when you think about the keratin um, layer of the outer layers of your skin. And so what we need is a cell to come from somewhere else and to migrate into the tissue and then turn into a skin cell. So we get a pluripotent stem cell migrating into the tissue. Pluripotent means it can turn into a number of different cell types. Um, not all the cell types, just some of the cell types. And so we'll get a cell migrating in. Now you can see by the color, it is not a skin cell. But then what will happen is it will differentiate into a skin cell, right? So we get pluripotent stem cell migration into the site, and then we get differentiation. And this happens in a number of places all around our body. Um, but skin is just a great example of that. Um, and so how does the 
uh, sorry, potent stem cell no to turn into a skin cell? Well, the answer is growth factors, right? Um, uh, uh, growth factors are a group of signaling molecules that are released from many cells that sort of tell all the cells around it, hey, this is what I am, and perhaps this is what you should be too. So uh, the skin cells and even the innate immune cells will release these growth factors that tell the pluripotent stem cell what kind of cell you should be. There's another little side note there, there was an interesting recent discovery, is another factor that tells that stem cell what to be is the rigidity of the tissue, which is absolutely fascinating. Basically, they found if you take a stem cell out of the body and you put it in a very rigid extracellular matrix, it will turn into a bone cell. If you put it in the loosest, softest matrix you can find, it could turn into a neuron. So one of the ways uh, a stem cell knows what to be is the rigidity of the tissue around it, as well as growth factors. Growth factors are very, very important in that. But that's an interesting little side note there about how um, our body knows how to organize itself based on the rigidity of what's going on around it. I love that, that's great research. Um, but there's other tissues like heart cells and neurons that are intrinsically not proliferative and are incredibly hard to replace. And in fact, we typically, for the most part, don't replace them. Now there is some neurogenesis going on in the brain, but it's very limited, right? Um, if you if you have a stroke um, and we came back 30 years later, we would not see that area of stroke, that area of dead tissue turned back into perfectly normal neuronal brain tissue, which we would see with the liver. Um, we would see um, uh, the brain would have adapted and evolved and essentially rewired its other healthy neurons to take up much of the load. So often stroke patients uh, can't move half their body and then later on they can. Um, and that's because of a rewiring of the brain rather than a growth of new neurons and a restoration of that tissue. That happens on a very limited capacity. So what we would see in a heart cell and a neuron, we would still see the migration of cells from elsewhere into it. Um, and But they wouldn't change back into the neurons or the heart muscle cells, right? They would stay this other type of cell. In the brain, it's often what's called an astrocyte or a glia. Right, so important factors that contribute to the healing process and how good it is, is the intrinsic proliferative capacity of the cells of the tissue, the growth factors, and the extracellular matrix, right? The rigidity of it, but also is it intact? So what happens when we damage that extracellular matrix? Well, if we damage the extracellular matrix, we need to grow that back. And a cell type called a fibroblast, um, in most tissues it'll be a fibroblast, comes along and it pumps out extracellular matrix. But this extracellular matrix won't be as organized as the ordinary extracellular matrix of the tissue. Um, and it will build up several layers like this to fill in that loss of gap. You can't put a cell in the middle of air or the middle of liquid. You need to build that matrix up into that liquid so cells can start to come in. And then maybe some of the fibroblasts would go um, and then um, perhaps parenchymal cells will come in. But what does this look like to you? What does this look like? We've got disorganized extracellular matrix. We've got fibroblasts, which is a different kind of cell to the typical parenchymal cell we see in this tissue. What does that look like? Now, when you think, what does it look like? It looks like a scar. And this is essentially what a scar is. We end up with disorganized extracellular matrix, and we often end up with some attempt to fill that scar in with some stuff. So if you think about um, a scar in your skin, it's often tougher, right? It often has different elastic properties to the rest of the skin. Um, it may be a little raised right? And it's sometimes discolored. And that's because we've got a different cellular composition, maybe more fibroblasts, maybe less melanocytes, which are the tanning cells of your skin. Um, we've got a disorganized extracellular matrix that isn't going to have that straight, same flex and response to the rest of the extracellular matrix of the skin. So that is what a scar is, right? It's this disorganized matrix. Oh, I want to touch on this just briefly. So if you really have a good, have a terrible night, really, in my opinion, by drinking way too much alcohol, right? What can happen is you not only damage the liver cells, you damage the extracellular matrix. You get such a die-off 
of your liver cells that you get a dye off of the extracellular matrix too. Now, if that happens once or twice, that's fine. Um, but what happens if it keeps happening over and over again? Every time the liver cells go out, there's repairs done to the extracellular matrix and another layer of fibrous um, material is laid down. And we can end up with a very fibrotic liver. This is what we call it. We call it a fibrotic liver. Um, and it actually starts to reduce the functionality of the liver and cause liver disease. So a chronic alcoholics often have this very fibrous liver. And in fact, you can actually palpate it. So you can tuck your fingers up your rib cage and feel your liver. And it actually feels firmer in people with fibrotic livers um, who have damaged their liver so much that every time the extracellular matrix is becoming more disorganized and there's more extracellular matrix being laid down. A little side note there. One other thing is what happens if the blood vessels get damaged, right? So we need to uh, lay down that extracellular matrix. We need to fill those tissues in, but then we need new blood vessels. And we call this angiogenesis. Angio is associated with blood vessels. Genesis means new. So we need new blood vessels. One of the key signaling molecules there is a thing called VEGF. Um, uh, VEGF is released by a number of cells, but um, fibroblasts release it and innate immune cells release it. And we end up with a concentration gradient. Uh, and this concentration gradient is depending on where there's low oxygen. Low oxygen induces VEGF expression, right? So we have low oxygen up here in this example. That induces VEGF expression. And now we end up with a concentration gradient. And now we end up with uh, almost a chemotrope where um, the cells will grow towards, it's a little bit chemotaxis, a little bit chemotropism, where the cells of the blood vessel will now grow up the uh, VEGF concentration gradient to generate a new blood vessel. And we end up with this tip cell, which comes from an endothelial cell, uh, climbing its way up this VEGF um, concentration gradient. And below it, the endothelial cells divide to generate, uh, and we call these stalk cells, to sort of pump in new pipe to build this new capillary coming out here. So this would just be a capillary growth um, because there's no smooth muscle in there. So this is how new blood vessels are made. Now, this whole process is very important when it comes to cancer. Cancer is a growing cell, uh, a growing bunch of cells that are typically not vascularized and so we end up with a hypoxic core that low oxygen environment induces VGF expression in things like macrophages but also parenchymal cells and fibroblasts um, and that VGF will now allow the vascularization of that cancer cell and we don't want that to happen so that is a potential drug target for anti-cancer therapies is to prevent the vascularization of cancer to limit its growth. Brilliant. So that is it. That's what happens when tissue damage happens, inflammation, all the way to resolution, and then finally to tissue repair. Thanks for joining me in this video series.